very much. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, this is material that obviously is COVID related. Um, it's material that's a bit more uh, applied in a sense than much of what I normally do. Um, and it's going to be a bit more descriptive than uh, my normal research. So I'm going to be talking uh, basically about uh, misinformation uh, in, in the COVID pandemic, though some of the things that I'm going to talk about have been seen in past pandemics. Um, so like the H1N1 pandemic, some of the details that I'll talk about, we're also seeing there also with SARS. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit about how it spreads and a little bit about how it is uh, generated in at least some cases. Okay, so um, let me say a bit about myself because uh, I, I think it's a little bit relevant to the material that I'm going to be presenting uh, and some of the points I'm going to try to make. So I did my PhD in uh, 2006. I was a fluid dynamicist um, looking at non-Newtonian fluids. Then I started disease modeling uh, actually in 2001. So during my PhD, I was uh, working as a summer student uh, doing disease modeling stuff. I did a postdoc at a US national lab. I was at a public health institution and a school of public health in the US. So what that means is that although I'm a mathematician, I've worked a lot with subject matter experts. Okay, and more recently, obviously I've been doing a lot of work modeling COVID, um, but I wanna emphasize, I have expertise for some aspects of COVID. I would not claim that I am an expert on everything in COVID. Uh, and I have to, it's important that we keep in mind where our expertise lies where, where the boundaries are and how we get the information we need to kind of step over our, our, where our boundaries are. Um, here's a photo of what I used to look like um, a little while ago. Uh, and I wanted, I saw an XKCD comic, uh, the new one out today. Um, and I, I wanna highlight this a little bit because some of what I'm going to be talking about is the challenges we have ourselves in realizing when we are responsible for spreading misinformation. Um, and so, yes, I'm going to talk about the misinformation that's been spread, but I, I wanna emphasize that, you know, the examples I'm going to give you are some really brilliant scientists uh, who have give, put out some very incorrect information. Uh, and so that, you know, as I'm doing that, I, I have to bear in mind that, you know what, um, I don't, exactly know what it is that necessarily makes me different from these people. Um, so you, there's got to be a certain amount of humility as you approach the information you encounter uh, about the pandemic. There's got to be some verification. And, and really, so you've, you've got to be careful, because otherwise, it's just a case of you're convinced you're right, everybody else is wrong, and you know, we don't actually solve the problems. OK. All right, so just a little bit about COVID. I don't think I need to say a whole lot. Um, SARS, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, it's really bad. Um, infection and counts can grow really quickly. Uh, if you want to suppress it, it mm -hmm. takes some really major interventions. Those interventions are also really bad. Um, you know, so the people in this audience uh, here, the people in Australia are in various amounts of lockdowns. So I, guess actually most of the Australians here are uh, in pretty good shape. They're in Western Australia or up, up north. Um, and those places aren't uh, locked down uh, so much as, for example, me. Um, you know, I, I can't go anywhere, basically. I, I can go five kilometers, uh, but only one person a day can leave the, leave the house home for shopping or anything like that. So these, these are really major interventions. They're causing a lot of pain. Um, but at the same time, SARS itself spreading would cause a lot of pain. Australia is in a kind of unique position compared to much of the rest of the world. So the decision process that I think is appropriate in Australia is not the same decision process that I think is appropriate in Europe. So we have to bear in mind the context that's going on. But there's a really important thing here. The appetite for these interventions. Let me get myself out. But I'll go with that. The appetite for these interventions is influenced by political ideology. People who 
uh, have particular political ideologies, have particular opinions about what um, about what intervention should be in place. And that actually influences what they believe. So what do I want to say? So social media. Social media has been a big uh, problem. Uh, it's, it's been very valuable um, during the pandemic because a lot of good information has been spread, but at the same time, a lot of misinformation happens. Um, and what you have to bear in mind with social media is that these companies make money when people stay on the uh, social media longer. And this has actually been a challenge for me because I'm writing a talk about uh, misinformation spreading on social media, which means I go to social media to look it up and they know how to get me to stay there. Um, so, uh, you know, you've got to be aware. This is, this is what social media really wants. They make money by people staying there longer and they get to control what you see. They have, you know, they've got some rules, you know, somebody retweets uh, with me tagged in it, I'll see that, but they, they have some control over what kind of information shows up. Um, and so they can influence what I see. At the same time, whoops, I got the wrong thing. At the same time, the people who are producing content, who are putting stuff onto uh, Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or whatever else, they, they, the sort of currency out there is how many followers you've got, how many people are watching you, how many people pay attention to what you say. And so, of course, you want to gain followers, you want to get a viral tweet out, whatever it is. So they also want to get engagement. So the, the social media companies want you to see things that you are going to pay attention to. The people producing content want to say things that uh, you're going to pay attention to. And it's really, this pro the problem is that the more extreme an opinion is, the more people will pay attention to it. And especially if these are confrontational, things that create arguments, those are things that really bring people into, um, into social media, get people to stay there. So they have a tendency to, give, to present more extreme uh, opinions um, to you and opinions that might start arguments. Now, this is divisive because it starts arguments, but it also is, you know, pushes people in different directions. It polarizes them because, you know, you're con you might be seeing one set of opinions that are rather extreme. You kind of go in that direction. So I want to talk about a mistake I made early in the pandemic showing what something that happens with social media. So early in the pandemic, um, I watched an interview from what a British minister talking about their plan for COVID. And he said something that I really disliked, really disagreed with. And I wrote a Twitter thread. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to use some of the Twitter emojis because, you know, just to liven it up a bit here. I wrote this Twitter thread. Um, and then um, it got retweeted a lot. I, I My follower account basically doubled, you know, 200 to 400 or something like that at that stage. Um, so, you know, th this from a, you know, am I trying to produce content to um, get, uh, to build my following and such, if I'm, if I'm trying to do this content for me, this was really good. I gained a lot of followers. I got a lot of retweets, but some of my colleagues uh, reached out to me and said, you know what, that thing you're saying um, what wasn't it said by, in an interview by the British minister is not accurate, okay? The guy misspoke, that, is, that aspect of the strategy is not true. Okay, so I put out misinformation. It got tweeted out a lot. So what do I do? Well, I try to take it down. So I took it down. I even put up a correction. I even asked people, could you please retweet this uh, so that the correction uh, also spreads because that incorrect information got a lot of attention, but it didn't happen. You know, basically my correction, you know, it got retweeted a little bit, uh, mostly by my colleagues in the UK who had told me about this issue, who actually, who cared about it. But for the most part, for the general public, it wasn't that interesting. It didn't get a lot of engagement. So the misinformation that happened spread really far, really quickly. The correction did not spread. It did not get to these people. So 
I net contributed to people having a misunderstanding of what was going on there. Now, I think there are people who use this actively to gain followers. You know, there, there are some people out there uh, who are tweeting a lot about COVID-19 who don't really bother themselves with whether it's accurate or not, uh, what they're tweeting. It's controversial, it gets, it gets attention. And then two days later, they might take it down if, uh, if it's gotten enough negative attention. So then they can take it down and say, oops, I, I made a little boo-boo there. And from then on, you know, you can't, you know, you, if you go and say, look, this guy's been spraying misinformation, the response is, yes, but I, I corrected that and I apologize for it. Yeah, but nobody saw that and you knew that that's what was going to happen. So this, this is one of the biggest problems I see uh, with social media, with uh, how misinformation spreads. The, not only is it that the extreme ideas spread really well, um, but the algorithms actually promote that spread. The psychology promotes that spread. And it's very hard to correct a mistake. You know, there's not a way to say, you know, there's not a little button I can tick saying everybody who saw that tweet of mine needs to also see this tweet. Okay. Okay, so there's my mea culpa. I, I've been responsible for some of this as well. Um, Let's talk a little bit what happens when we see misinformation, when we see something that's not accurate. So if I'm a typical person, the first thing I do is I try to evaluate, I see some information and I, I have a filter saying, hey, do I believe this? Well, it's consistent with my desired policy. So yeah, that, that seems plausible. Or that, that's, that would mean this policy that I support is wrong. So no, I don't believe it. I, you know, I'm going to investigate as a typical person, I'm going to investigate a new fact much more closely if it disagrees with what I want. I'm, I'm going to be investigated much more critically. I'm going to look for flaws in the logic if it disagrees with what I believe should happen. And if it's consistent with what I believe should happen, there's a good chance I'm not going to question it at all. And, okay. The next bit is, you know, maybe I'm not sure, but the people that I disagree with are attacking it. And so since I know that they believe false things, it must be true. This also happens. This is a polarizing effect. It ends up splitting up the, the communities uh, in such a way that effective things can't happen. Um, this is hardly a COVID uh, specific thing. Um, and I think that this is actually uh, one of the biggest threats uh, worldwide right now about social media is this kind of stuff, the fact that it really works to polarize uh, populations. And so what are we going to do? Well, I like that content. It, I agree with that content. I'm going to, you know, I believe it's true and it's controversial. I'm going to follow this person who, who said that so that I will get more cutting edge truth coming to me. So I, I'm now following this person. Or sometimes I've discovered this, if I tweet something that, um, if I, if I tweet something that upsets people, I, I tend to pick up some followers who, whose basic role is, you know, the reason they're following me is so that they can uh, troll whenever I say something. So if I say something that gets a lot of attention, I, I end up at the, I used to leave it alone, but now at this stage, I go through my new followers and I kick them off or not based on whether what they seem to, when I look at the things that they say, whether they're engaging honestly or not with the information or whether, to be fair, whether I think they're engaging honestly or not with the information. Um, so, you know, again, I have to worry about that projection. Do, am I, when I say that they're engaging honestly, maybe, maybe that's my own uh, influence. Okay. But the, the consequence is that eventually my interactions are with people I agree with uh, in a positive way or people I disagree with in a negative way. And it's very hard to it, it, it's very hard to have um, more broad uh, communities that interact that um, that engage in kind of a useful constructive way. You end up with you know there's a set of people that I you know that I follow. Um, there's a set of people whose tweets I'm likely to see, um, and I can pretty well predict based on who they are uh, whether I'm going to agree with them. Now some of them. 
I'm going to disagree with them because they are uh, vehemently anti-lockdown and are saying things that uh, I don't believe are true. But some of them I disagree with because they are vehemently pro-lockdown. So I, I hope I'm in the middle. But, you know, I, I, it's, that's a really hard thing to judge. Um, OK. So what should I talk about here? Examples of misinformation. So I think a lot of you guys have seen some misinformation about COVID by now. <clears throat> you've, seen, um, you've seen stuff about how severe the disease is, um, whether or not uh, the vaccines work, or at least you've seen that people are saying stuff about these things. So here are, I've, I've got a whole bunch of examples of things I have seen. I'm going to talk about them a bit. Okay. All right. So this, this is something that's been said since the start of the uh, pandemic. People die with COVID. They don't die from COVID. They, happen, they have COVID when they die, and therefore they're being recorded as a COVID death. It's, it's not real. And at some stage, there came out information that only 6% of deaths attributed to COVID are actually COVID. So let's talk a little bit about the source for that 6%. Um, the CDC um, kind of put out some statistics and 6% of the people who had died of COVID had no other cause whatsoever mentioned on their uh, death certificate. The rest of them had things like obesity, heart disease, pneumonia, or other, other factors that could have, that likely did contribute to their death. But that, that doesn't mean that those people would be alive or would be dead today if they hadn't gotten COVID. They, they died because they got COVID and many of them would have lived for many years uh, on after that. <clears throat> Somebody who has had a, a liver transplant can expect to live a pretty long life, but if he gets an infectious disease that kills him, the liver transplant still shows up on that death certificate, okay? Uh, and here, here are some things to respond to that. You know, so some of the actual facts that, you know, I, I can't look at this and say, at this claim and say, no, it's not true, I'm going to move on. You do actually have to do a little bit of research, but often it's just a matter of, okay, well, what facts are on the ground um, that are really clear, especially when they're large scale. The larger scale the data you can have, the more confident you can be in whether or not uh, the effect is or is not real. So in this case, um, there were refrigerated trucks uh, at coming to morgues in some places. You've got hospitals outright stating that they do not have the capacity to handle the patients they had. <coughs> You've got in India, they were, there are places in India where they were running low on wood that they were using for cremation. Um, you can see from satellite images that cemeteries are having a lot more graves dug in them. There's clearly people dying more so than what used to be happening. And there, it's correlated with a whole bunch of people being infected with COVID. It, it, it's deaths caused by COVID. Here's a statistic that comes out often. Um, the fatality rate is 0.2%. And that's like the flu. Now, flu is probably lower than that even, um, especially if you were to measure flu deaths the same way you measure COVID deaths. Um, but th this statistic is something I will talk about it a bit more. I'll talk about its source. Um, but the, the clear response to that is in many populations, like in the US, in the United States, more than 0.2% of the entire population uh, has died. Even though many people in the US have not been infected or have been vaccinated before they got infected, you know, they, there are many people who are still susceptible. You can see that in how the case counts are going. Um, there's many people who are vaccinated. We have nowhere close to all of the population of the US has been infected, and yet 0.2% of the population has died. The, there's no way that that's consistent with um, this kind of fatality rate. All right, vaccinated people transmit as much as unvaccinated. This is harder. Uh, you know, it's harder to collect the data. Um, and I think part of the issue here is that early on, before people had much data, 
the, the guidance was you may transmit just as easily. You should assume you can transmit just as easily, but it wasn't well communicated that we don't have the information yet. We don't have the data yet. And so many people interpreted that as, no, you really are. And then of course, we've now seen that viral loads can be high. Um, transmission can, can happen. Um, but you know, we, do know, we do know some biological things about it that make that unlikely. The viral loads can get as high, but most of the time they're lower in the sense that they might have the same peak, but the, there's less viable virus um, and the peak goes down very quickly. All right. Okay. Um, now this is getting back to stuff I saw very early in the pandemic. The spread here, whether it's the US, Europe, or wherever, will be different from that other place. So um, initially I saw a lot about, oh, Asians, they have this receptor in their lungs that most Europeans don't have. And so that's why it's so bad in Europe. Later, you know, so they were saying genetically Asians are more susceptible. Since then I've seen people arguing, well, the reason Asia uh, controls it so well is because Asians are genetically less susceptible. Um, and yeah, I, I've seen both arguments from the same people. Um, yeah, anyways, turns out that in most places, it pretty much spreads the same. There's not that much variation between people. Uh, there's differences because of demography, um, things like that. But aged care facilities, we saw aged care facilities get hit in Italy. We saw them get hit in the US. We saw them get hit in the UK. And what do you know, uh, six months later, they were getting hit in Victoria. Um, though for exactly the same reasons, um, you know, the casual workforce, uh, people working at multiple facilities. We, we knew from every country that this was going on and then somehow they didn't fix it in, the U, uh, in Australia. Okay, so, okay. I'm gonna kind of skip through this uh, kind of quickly, uh, this last bit, just to make sure I, I move on. Uh, but, you know, you see that the case you know, people saying it's not really a pandemic because it's just a lot of, well, it's not, it's just a lot of cases. It's not really bad. Um, we aren't seeing deaths. Two weeks later, we see deaths. Um, you've got now with the vaccine, people saying the vaccine has been linked to thousands or tens of thousands of deaths in the US. And what that, it, what that link is, is that when somebody dies who has recently been vaccinated, somebody can fill out a report saying this person died who was recently vaccinated and with a few details about it you're vaccinating mil literally tens of millions of elderly people, it's hardly a surprise that tens of thousands of them have died within a few months of that. Okay, um, continuing on, I think one of the biggest challenges is we have right now is children. Uh, children are highly infectious or uh, children barely transmit. I see both of these arguments. I don't know, um, but both of those arguments are made with a lot of confidence. Um, and often with insults for the people who don't believe them. Um, and to me, you know, I guess I say we, I, I really don't know what to trust there. Uh, I, I struggle with that one uh, because to me, I, the there's just not enough data. Uh, there's not enough high quality data that certainly I have seen. Okay. All right, so let's talk about what, you know, there's that huge slew of misinformation I, I gave you. What are the characteristics? Well, one of them um, is this sort of, you know, there's some statistical fallacies going on. Um, yeah, th this XKCD came out about the time that a lot of stuff about the vaccine started spreading, saying that you've got a lot of, un you've got a lot of vaccinated people showing up in hospitals more unvaccinated or more vaccinated people showing up in hospitals in this country than, than, than unvaccinated people. So obviously it's not protecting the vaccinated people because there's more of them going into the hospital. Well, sure, but the vast majority of people in the high risk age groups are vaccinated in those places. So, so at, you know, this was, this was I, I wonder if that's the reason that uh, the XKCD guy came out with that, but let's see. First thing is, when you see misinformation, uh, if it's going to be something you end up believing, usually it's the thing that really predicts whether or not a lot of people believe it is whether it aligns with the desired policy. 
not what's the scientific basis for it, it's does it align with the policy that I believe should happen. You know, usually, at least at a glance on the data, it seems plausible, and this is enough for most people. If it looks plausible, I mean, even this is enough for, I'd say, most people, but these two things together, uh, that's convincing. If it highlights how stupid the other side is, even better. Um, then, then, you know, rock solid, um, you know, nobody, no rational person could possibly believe uh, that this is not true. Um, look at the, the data, the data is so clear. Um, you, we should do what I already wanted to do. Oh, yeah. So it rarely, rarely does it bring somebody closer to the middle kind of towards a consensus. It usually is something that's polarizing. And then finally, something that really helps is when you start to hear it from multiple sources. Now, the problem with this is that you think that they're independent. Your, your brain naturally assumes that, hey, I've heard this from five people. They're independent. Well, Twitter is Twitter or Facebook or whatever is actively showing you uh, certain types of uh, content. These, the content that starts to come out, it comes out from one person. It maybe gets to three or four other people. They repeat it. And all of a sudden, you are hearing it from three or four sources that you think are independent, but they aren't. They, they, it's a consequence of the algorithm um, that's controlling what we see that's led to um, this kind of effect. All right. So now I want to talk about, so I've talked a little bit about kind of the misinformation that's out there. I want to talk about some specific cases. And I struggled a bit with whether I should do this or not, because I'm I'm going to need to name people uh, in doing this. Um, I'm only really naming really, really prominent people uh, who have no reason to be afraid of uh, me uh, saying, saying bad things about them. Uh, but the basic idea here is, you know, I, I'm, I've worked really hard in my field. I, I have, in what I do, I have deeper insight than everybody else I interact with. And because of that, you know, I, I have some unique insights into how this disease is spreading. And, you know, some infectious disease experts disagree with me. How dare they? I'm going to prove to them that I'm right. That's kind of what I believe is the attitude of a lot of people, not everybody. The, one of the cases I'm going to talk about, I don't think is this, but the other two, I think this plays a big role in it. Um, so I'm going to talk about these three people. Johnny Onidis, the IHME, this is a group at University of Washington who I, I actually have friends who work at IHME. Um, and I'll be talking specifically about their early model. They've improved the model quite a bit. Uh, Michael Levitt, so Johnny Onidis, uh, I'll give you some details about him. He may be the most cited scientist ever. I'm not sure, he's, he's, he's up there. Um, Michael Levitt has a Nobel Prize in chemistry. You know, these, are, these are big names, these are serious scientists. They do good work. Um, I'm not going to say much about uh, another person, but I want to highlight there are, you know, I would say the first three have undersold what I believe is going on with the pandemic. The, this fourth person has oversold it. Uh, I don't think that, you know, but he hasn't made predictions so much, um, tweets and trying to, figure out, you know, trying to find a, something that I can talk about as an example was, was kind of hard with him. So, um, but I do want to say this sort of misinformation is on both sides. Okay. All right. So here's Johnny Anidis. Uh, he probably has more citations than all of us put together. Um, he has 217 papers that have gotten at least 217 uh, citations. Um, so far this year, he's published um, about 80 papers. Um, and no question, his expertise that he has better than just about anyone else is he knows how researchers can fool themselves with poor study design. And that honestly is terrifying to me because I'm going to talk about how poor his study design was. And if he can make those mistakes, you know, what, what does that mean for, uh, for any of us? 
you know, th this is the guy who should know. So early on in the pandemic, uh, 3,000 people would die, uh, assuming that uh, there was no intervention in place at all. They just let it go. You get 10,000 to 40,000 deaths. Um, and you know, he suggested 10,000 one thing, and then later in an interview, he said his best guess was 40,000. Okay. Now, for the record, I think it's 630,000 so far. Um, and that's with a lot of vaccine, that's with a lot of interventions. Uh, they, they've worked hard to keep the number down to 630,000. So something went wrong. So what uh, the study that he did right at the beginning was based in Santa Clara, that's a county in California, so uh, West Coast. And he wanted to infer the infection fatality rate. So this is the number of people for every, for 100 infections, actual infections, people will die. So this people who show up at hospital, but this is actual just infections. And so uh, it's hard to know how many infections have happened. This is at the start of any new epidemic. This is one of the hardest things to get because you don't know who has been infected. You only know who has shown up in hospital to start off with. That's why the pandemic influenza um, in 2009, there was so much fear about it because half of the people that they knew about had died. Um, and then they quickly learned that you know, almost nobody who was getting infected was showing up in hospital. So, okay, you you measure antibodies in the population. That's your test for whether these people have been infected or not. You look at how many deaths have happened, um, and that's all you need. The test has some false positives, so okay, you need to do some statistics to sort that out. But you know, th this is all doable. This is this is a workable plan, except. He's doing this in a population where there's very low prevalence. So there's actually less than, I believe it was less than 2% of tests uh, actually uh, in evidence of infection. When you've got something that produces false positives, this is a problem. Evaluate it. Um, the statistician who was evaluating the test uh, refused to let her name be put on the paper because she didn't believe the, uh, that they were that they had good enough data to make the claims they were making. Um, they recruited the test subjects through Facebook. And some of these test subjects were told, hey, would you like to know whether you, you have had COVID or not? If you've had it in the past, get this test. So they're doing stuff that is you know, biasing it for people who are already infected. They didn't disclose that some of the funding uh, came from somebody who's who was vehemently opposed to uh, a lot of interventions. These are, these are red flags. You know, John Ioannidis would not tolerate somebody else doing this. I don't know whether it's because he is such an expert, he feels comfortable that he can handle doing these things and then for them. Um, but the result was that, okay, they came up with a prediction that 0.17% of the US, uh, or sorry, 0.17% of infections died. So that's that 0.2% that I mentioned earlier that people say that's the fatality rate. It's coming from this study. At this stage, more than 0.17% of the US has died of COVID, even though um, many people in the US have not been infected. Um, and even at the time they came out with this result, we had already exceeded that in New York City. Okay, so much larger populations, with much larger, uh, you know, you've got, you can get much better data when you have a large population where you aren't dealing with the fact that the positive cases you're detecting may or may not be comparable to your false positive rate. So moving on to the IHME model. Uh, this was a, this is a big research institute at University of Washington. Again, I friends who are on it. And this model really became the favorite of the fact that it's, uh, the predictions were much lower than what the disease models were putting out there. Now it's data science based. It's taking a lot of data, plugging it into a computer with um, all, all sorts of data science uh, bells and whistles on it and coming out with a prediction. There was something strange about the confidence intervals. Um, namely, 
the confidence intervals seemed to shrink a lot faster than seemed really plausible. And they had massive confidence intervals for what would happen on the next day. So based on the data up to here, they're predicting that the next day would have somewhere in that range. And then it would rapidly shrink. And that actually in this prediction by June 15th, uh, the, there would be no cases left in the US. They had that with 100% certainty uh, as a pr projection of their model. Um, absolutely, there would be no cases left in the US. Um, that was very far from what happened. Um, the, the predictions were changing. Uh, there we go. Sorry, my internet connection seems a bit slow, but there were big adjustments to their predictions from one day to the next. Uh, their predictive total number of fatalities would change by 10%, even though there was nothing really unusual about the data that day. So there was something clearly wrong. Now they have improved the model, um, but there was something clearly wrong. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. There's Michael Levitt, Nobel Prize winner, 43,000 citations, all sorts of accolades. Great scientist, no question. Um, but is he the right person? He's got a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Is he the person who should be talking to a prime minister of Israel about what their intervention should be? Well, let's see. So what happened? He looked at the data from China right at the beginning. Uh, and what he saw was something that from the usual prediction. So the usual prediction get exponential growth because the rate of new infections is proportional. When I is small, the number of infections is small, this means you should get exponential growth in infections. He saw that it was actually growing slower than that. You know, the constant proportionality seemed to be decreasing in time. So the behavior is actually growing sub-exponentially. And he decided this is a universal law. He made some predictions based on it. And he did a really good job of predicting the total number of cases in China. Now, I think that you know, the reason for this observation he made was because China was intervening at the time, getting stronger and stronger interventions. So it's hardly a surprise that the, the rate at which people transmitted was going down. But he took this and then tried to apply it to other uh, data. So when he did this, he, has, he concluded that the number of cases, the cumulative number of cases would look like this formula. So you've got an exponential of an exponential of something, and it's pre-factor in is the final size of the epidemic that he's predicting. He's predicting that you'll get a final size of A. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you've got that form. So just fit that to your early data. And as it, once it fits, you'll know the final number of infections if you're looking at infections or deaths if you're looking at deaths. And in China, he predicted both of these numbers really well. Here's his predictions for New York um, from his paper or from his preprint. And what I want to highlight here, uh, the, red, the red boxes are his best prediction based on the data up to that day. You can't read the dates very well, uh, but this is, say, here, this is April of 2020 for New York City. And what you see is that for a long, long time, they're predicting almost nothing. Very, very little is going to happen. It's going to be a very tiny epidemic. And then all of a sudden, the prediction goes crazy. Uh, this is trying to predict the final size. And that's, you know, that it's overshooting. Uh, and then it comes back down. And somewhere about here, uh, once my cursor catches up with my hand, there we go. Somewhere about there, it becomes a reasonable projection of what's going to happen by the end of that wave. But by that stage, you know, if you look at the data, the wave is really actually almost over. You know, the peak is at this inflection point. We're looking at cumulative cases. So the peak is there. And what we've seen is that, you know, how would you know when you can trust this prediction? If you had seen somebody predicting almost nothing and then suddenly predicting this huge number, and then within a week, they're predicting this smaller number, and then it starts increasing, how would you know? You, you can't. And this is consistent across many, many, many data sets he's looked at, that he's got this under prediction early and then this wild, wild stuff happening before it finally converges. Uh, what did, he was interviewed for Jerusalem Post on March 20th, saying that he didn't expect it to hit 10 deaths in Israel. 
uh, here's deaths in Israel, and what they had more than 10 deaths in a day. There we go. So within a month, they had more, more than 10 deaths in a single day, even though he was suggesting it wouldn't be 10 deaths cumulatively. Uh, he, he was nowhere close to right. And it's because his data, his method, I, I believe it was because he was using this method that systematically does a massive underprediction at early times. Uh, he made similar predictions for what was going on in Italy. At that stage, Italy was having a terrible, terrible epidemic. And he said, Italy's already halfway through the disease. Again, this is March 20th. Um, so March 20th, that's this day right here. That was March 20th, it's halfway through the disease. So you see that wave continued to grow for a while um, and it took a really long time to go down. It went down much slower than he had anticipated. And I, I think it also grew for longer than he anticipated, but I'm not sure. Uh, but it, they were nowhere close to halfway through uh, the disease. So, okay, he's making mistakes. IHME is making mistakes. What's going wrong with, with these guys? So I'm about to wrap up here. The big thing is both of these models are based on, they've assumed that the epidemic curve comes from some shape, some family of shapes. And because of that, the early growth, if you can fit all your parameters based on your early growth, the early growth is determining, you know, what you observe in the early growth is determining what your prediction is for late time. So your prediction for, well, not even late time, intermediate time, your prediction past the very early stages is entirely determined by what you're seeing in the early stages. Now you've assumed a particular shape, so you find the best fit shape, but what guarantee is there that that shape has anything to do with reality in the intermediate stage and the late stage? Basically, these models just, they go up, they go down. And that's about all that went into, you know, as far as I can tell, that's all the thought that went into the IHME model. Um, that's, and there was just a little tiny bit more thought that went into Levitt's model. So what happened in the IHME model is they assumed that if it went up really fast, it would come down really fast as well. And so each time they it continued growing past what they expected, their prediction for what was going to happen in the future was that it was gonna go down even faster. And it, that's, that's not, the, that's not the case. That's just not how, you know, if you've got a mechanistic model, you would realize that that's, that's not necessarily true. It can be, but not, not the sort of shape that they were assuming there. Uh, so, yeah, so, so in both cases, they have no mechanistic justification for the shape they've chosen. So great, if, if they can fit the early dynamics well, that doesn't tell you that they fit anything about the late dynamics. And in at least Michael Levitt's case, I was, and I think also IHME's case, I think that the shape that they assumed could not fit the early dynamics in most places. Um, certainly, on, they would only fit if there were interventions acting in a particular way. So some discussion. Uh, you know, this, this audience, um, you guys are, uh, some of you are more data science-y than me. Um, I think most of you are probably more data science-y than me. So I want to kind of give some, some warnings, some comments. If you want to apply data science techniques to epidemiology, uh, you should talk to somebody with infectious disease expertise sooner than later. Okay, otherwise you're going to put some assumptions in, you're, you'll bake some assumptions in that seem quite reasonable. Epidemics go up, they go down. So let's take a shape where it goes up and down. And then you are going to realize that there, there's fundamental mistakes that happen because of that, or fundamental, there are fundamental challenges, I should say, rather than mistakes. Um, and that, what that mistake is, is that there's a lot of complex nonlinear dynamics. So what happens in the early stages of an epidemic does not tell you very much if you don't, if you don't know the mechanistic shape, if you don't know what the right family of shapes is, you're not going to get a good prediction of the intermediate stages or the late stages. And if it's a recently introduced disease, you, you, you won't have data that you can use to inform that idea. You won't be able to say, well, this is what the epidemic looked everywhere else. Okay. So, so if you can't say, hey, the epidemic looked like this 
and a few lots of other places, I'm going to assume a shape kind of like that. And you know, you're in an early stage of a pandemic where you haven't seen a full epidemic anywhere, and you use the wrong shape, you're going to make the wrong prediction. Um, you need to evaluate the quality of the data that you're using. Um, I, I know, you know, I talk to data scientists and they say half their life is data cleaning. Um, so hopefully uh, for a lot of data scientists, they realize this. Some of the examples I gave you, they just took the data on face value. Um, predictions about India uh, will be taken on face value, even though we know that parts of India were overwhelmed. Pretty Italy being taken on face value, even though we're not in hospitals. And for anything, for anything, uh, you've got to look for evidence that your conclusions are wrong. Not look for evidence that you're right. You've got to look for evidence that you're wrong. And often where that comes from is taking um, data, data that's, um, uh, taking some data that didn't go into your analysis. I mean, data scientists know this. You don't use the same data that went into your analysis to test your model. Um, but uh, often there are data sets that look at something different. So if you're making a prediction about uh, cases, look at the deaths. Or if you're making a prediction about what the cases will look like, and you know one subpopulation has been tested really accurately or really well, are your, are your predictions consistent with what's been happening in that subpopulation? And if not, you, know, you need to look for all of these things. There's lots of places. So, okay. And yeah, so... Uh, finally, just because the result is dramatic does not mean it's correct. Uh, this is a bias that, that social media really uh, takes advantage of. So, well, okay, so I thought, okay, and be careful about appeal to your own authority. So I will stop there. Um, thanks. Appreciate the audience. Great talk, Joel. Um, Maybe we will have uh, yeah. time for one short uh, question. Okay, I, I got a question so, in there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, yeah, sorry, I, I did run longer than I thought. Uh, but um, so yeah, do I believe spreading misinformation is worse than providing no preliminary information? Well, so this is one of the big challenges uh, that's happened is you know, providing information with appropriate uh, qualifiers does not spread as well. Um, but I think, yes, providing early information has been important, uh, has been useful, but it's been important also that the people doing this uh, kind of do some caretaking to make sure that the information they're putting out includes information about the weaknesses of the assumption, weaknesses or you know, where things are, are questionable. I think that's a really important thing that needs to be there. Um, yeah, do I suggest more conservative? Oh, do I suggest more conservative public health approaches on interventions. Um, I, I don't think that's my role. Um, my role is to make a projection um, of what would happen under different scenarios. And I do not know, you know I, I have expertise in how the disease spreads. I do not have expertise in what happens to children who are uh, kept home from school. Um, somebody else who has that expertise also needs to talk to uh, the politicians or the policymakers, and those have to those have to be there. But yeah, if if there's not enough data available to be confident, you know, you you've got to that's a, that's how the policy decisions are made. They've got to you know they they've got to make decisions in within complete information. Uh, so we've got to give them a range of you know this these are the plausible scenarios. These are what we think is our best guesses of which ones are more likely. Um, this is what the worst case scenarios could be. Um, and you know, it's that, that's why, that's why these people are elected, um, or in most places, that's why they're elected is because they are being trusted to make that kind of decision. All I can do is say, Hey, this is what, when I'm talking to a policymaker, this is what my projections are. Um, yeah. So thank you. All right. So thanks very much again, Joe yeah. and participants for joining us. And looking forward to seeing you in our next seminar. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thanks, guys. Really appreciate you guys coming.